Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the 10th of December, uh, 2014, and um, we have been talking ever since August uh, and September, um, and into last week we had a, a, a really, um, I think, it's an interesting conversation about Black Lives Matter, about Ferguson, about um, the um, different things that are going around, um, starting that sort of got kicked off, unfortunately, with the, the shooting of Michael Brown. And um, as a lot of people have talked about, um, and we're excited about always, uh, youth are sort of at the forefront of the different conversations and movements around all of this. So uh, many of us are about youth voices. So we invited, um, and got to say, uh, Don, Joe, and Chris here um, invited their students to join us. So let's quickly go around and introduce ourselves if, if we can. And um, yeah, and there are some others here too as well. Uh, uh, let's start. Let's start alphabetically. Al, do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Okay. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> Al Elliott, uh, fifth grade educator, uh, Hoover, Alabama. Cool. Ariana. Welcome. Okay, I thought it was me. I wasn't sure. Um, I'm Ariana. I'm a junior at Oakmas High School. Miss Reed is my teacher. Cool. And that's in Michigan. Yes, it's in Michigan. Okay, welcome, Carlos. Hello. Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Carlos Avila. I am a, a, junior, a senior, <laughs> and uh, I go to uh, Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City. Very cool. And Carlos, uh, just to say, you're making a video. Is that the same Carlos? Yes. Yes, I am. Okay, so we'll get into it. Chris yeah. talked about that last week. Chris Sloan, mm -hmm. welcome. Yeah, so my name is Chris Sloan. I teach high school English and media at Judge Memorial. I'm Carlos's media teacher. So uh, he's doing really interesting stuff, um, and so uh, I've mentioned him a couple times, and so I'm happy he's joining us tonight. Very cool. And Chris Rogers. Hey, how everybody doing? Uh, Chris Rogers, uh, media technology specialist at Green Street Friends in Philadelphia. Um, great to be here, and great to see so many youthful faces. Can't wait to hear your voices. Great. Welcome, John. Don, are you there? I think yeah. she's frozen. Okay, we'll come back to Don. Don, you may have to come back in. Joe, you want to introduce, or have the, the people there introduce themselves? Uh, sure. Okay. Hi, Hi. Uh, this is my mom. Uh, <laughs> my name is Angela. I'm a sophomore at Berkeley High. Hi, I'm Justice. I'm a freshman at Berkeley High. And I'm the mom, and uh, I teach senior English over in uh, East Oakland at Fremont High. Very cool. So I just saw on the Black uh, Lives Matter uh, Twitter feed that Berkeley High just walked out. Is that yeah. true? Uh, I went and uh, we walked from Berkeley High City Hall to uh, Berkeley uh, University campus and then we uh, kind of protested on Campanile. Interesting. Very cool. So we'll hear more about that. And Sam. Welcome. Yeah, yeah, Sam Reed. I teach young people uh, to read, write, and make sense of the world at the U School in Philadelphia. And Kristen? You're there hi. now, Don, by the way. Go ahead. Uh, oh, okay. Um, hi, I'm Kristen. I attend the same school as Ariana, and I have the same teacher so as well. Cool. Don, can, you, can we hear you now? Oh, I thought I saw her move. No? Mm -hmm. Well, she'll continue to work on that. All right. And I'm Paul Allison here in New York City. Um, I, so, snappy question to get started. Uh, what's, uh, let me ask the students this. When your teachers talk to you about this, um, you, you know, you've kind of agreed, volunteered to come here. Why were you interested to come talk about this? What, what's the this that's, uh, that's going on for you? How do you see what's going on around the race, police brutality, around the issues that are going around out there? 
and the young um, people was. Go ahead. Okay. Um, for me, I got really interested in this because, like, in class, we often talk about this a lot, and there was lots of interesting points and opinions, and I, and I actually got curious on what others have to say, and especially of how what teachers would like, how a teacher would form their opinion, mm -hmm. like how like adults would, like how the adults viewed this um, situation. That's interesting. Yeah. So, can you can you describe more what the conversation looks like in class? Like, which classes you do it in? And uh, majority we do it in the same um, in the class that me and Ariana go from S with Miss Reed. And oftentimes we will like <laughs> get into a big circle in class, and we will like discuss about this. We would. Um, we wouldn't like do it as if it was like a conversation at lunch table or like convers or like a meeting, like not too serious yet not too, I don't know, um, not too joking like, but like we would, we would like often. We discuss it in a loose type of forum. Yeah. Wow. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Ariana, say more. Um, I was interested in this because this has always been like something that has caught my attention, and we've talked about this in like my government class, and we managed to talk about it like without bringing race into it. So I wanted to see like if other people thought it was a problem only because of the race issue or what. So what's the this if it's not about race? Well, the problem that innocent people are being shot and killed mm -hmm. when they don't need to be. That's true. So yeah, can they can they elaborate on like how how that sounds with um, talking about it out of racial context? I'm I'm curious too. Because people are being shot when they don't like killed. Like you don't shoot to kill, you shoot to injure if you're police. So. It makes it worse that there's like the race is the race issue, but if you take race out of it, it's still a problem, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Ariana reminds me of a um, conversation that we had at our school when um, some of the students talked about it as if it was a, they they related more to like the human. We talk about human rights. I think what Ariana kind of speak to that, and um, it gets into this whole. Um, Awesome. When we talk about like Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter, I know you, I, I know you've been reading about that, Sam. But mm -hmm. I'm glad that you brought that up, Ariana. That was really um, a great discussion. Yeah, Carlos, do you want to check in? Oh yeah. Well, I was really interested in this also because, like, when when we hear about these stories, it's a lot about the adults or the ones writing or reporting. And it's kind of interesting to see, you know, all of us younger people's point of view, especially in different parts of the country. So that's one of the interesting things that caught my attention when Mr. Sloan asked me if I wanted to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. do, do you want to talk a little more about your project and how um, you yes. what you thought? Um, so yeah, my project is uh, about racial diversity in the police force. and. It's uh, where we want to see if the uh, if we think that the that the uh, police force should uh, reflect the community's population. So uh, here in Utah, the city West Valley of West Valley has the uh, least diverse uh, police force in the nation, which is one of the things that was really uh, that really struck my attention when I heard about it, and so I wanted to go into more detail with it and see what the officers thought about that. And I was able to interview one, and one of the things that they that he told me was how at times also the uh, officers don't really confront people. Well, in his view, he doesn't really see it as a race, like going up to one guy and being like, oh, because you're you know, of a minority that uh, he should be being confronted. But rather, he just sees it as someone breaking a law and not in actual, like an actual race. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
And so I, um, I mean, I mean, if I could just reflect back, I think you yeah. said that um, the 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 police force is mainly white. Is that right? Yes, 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 it is. In West Valley. Yeah. And. Um, West Valley is not mainly white. Is that true? Or yes, it's, it's uh, well, it's, it has a lot of minorities, and that's most of the population. It's what it consists of. Yet the police officer, when he apprehends somebody, does not see race. That's what it's sort of like Stephen, Stephen Colbert. <laughs> but he doesn't see yeah. race. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, is that where you're? Is that fair? Yeah. And one of the other things that he says is to build the trust is how they're, they say they're reaching out to the communities by, you know, attending many of the events that people of those communities hold to try and build more trust with them. Uh, because it's like more of if you, like before, how it was more of you, if you're either confronted by an officer, you're breaking a law, or you're a suspect. So it's never really a positive. But what they're trying to do is, you know, getting to be familiar with the, the officer as a person. And so you kind of feel a little more uh, like straightforward with them and it it kind of just helps both sides because if you do break a law you won't kind of like panic as much if you're confronted by a familiar face rather than someone you've like never seen before. Joe, then, you're, go ahead then Chris. Go ahead. Carlos is uh, also, um, he was did some interviews of uh, their youth kind of program. They have a thing called Explorer. Uh, so, Carlos, you want to talk a little bit about that and then um, yeah. talk about that a little. Yeah, so yeah, the Explore program is uh, for people, I think it was from 16 to 21, I believe. But they're, uh, they're youth that are interested in being involved in the police force and, you know, they do training and that kind of stuff to get them prepared and uh, ready for the situation. And what one of the things I did notice of the of the people that were involved, it seemed pretty, uh, like, even with uh, people of minority, like, of color and uh, that are white. So it seemed pretty, it's like they they try and build that uh, diversity within their system, and it was very interesting to see that, and to get what they thought of it. Okay. And I just want to get the, uh, Joe and your sons, right, uh, yeah. their voices in here, too. Thank you for coming, guys. Uh, what What are your first thoughts, and maybe tell us more about the walkout that you just participated in? Okay, um, well, uh, uh, the walkout last week. Uh, if you could uh, lean uh, more toward the mic. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, it's before six, it started up before six period, and then it uh, went all the way through six period for another about uh, three hours. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, yeah, and then it lasted for maybe two to three hours, and then um, what basically happened, we were chanting all the usual uh, slogans uh, against shooting and choking, uh, like, we can't breathe, and I was, I'm losing my voice, I lost a lot of my voice because of it, and it was just really uh, amazing because it was kind of every single diversity possible that you can imagine, the human race, religion, um, I mean, everything was there, and then uh, what we did was everybody was kind of unified, and I'm glad there was no, because uh, there have been a lot of um, rioting, and, and like police, uh, police actually getting involved with the gas before in protest. But I'm glad this one was different. I think mainly it was because we were high schoolers, and if they were to do anything to us, that would have been a bigger problem, because predominantly there was maybe 1,000 to 1,200 kids there, and um, I even talked to my... Uh, uh, high school vice principal about this and uh, right after the protest and she said she fully endorsed it and fully backed all of us up and I don't mind the fact that I was marked absent in, in uh, my class because I just feel like it was more uplifting to do this than to actually go into class and not be a part of it because uh, the idea that uh, if I saw this and it kind of like said something to me it's like if you uh, are neutral then you are kind of uh, against the victim of the crime. And I just felt like if I didn't do anything, then I wouldn't be representing something that was actually a huge problem within our justice system, which is actually um, uh, police brutality. And uh, part of the fact is I personally don't like to see race, but it is a problem with uh, police and targeting us 
uh, specifically me because I am a child of color. And um, but I'm not afraid of police. I treat them as another human being. Uh, comparing that, like people of higher authority, can be uh, a little awe-inspiring sometimes because they have they can have that effect on you. But uh, the way I react around them is I try to treat them like if they were just a friend and I saw them and I was waving. And a lot of the times they wave back to me. But it's uh, the fact that some people think that oh, no matter what, I'm going to be targeted and. Uh, if, even if I'm not targeted, I'm still going to be looked upon differently by them. But if uh, you just treat them like somebody like you normally see on the street, they're not going to, they would never do anything because they are just a regular human being. Yeah, uh, to add on, like, the reason why I'm also, like, interested in what happened uh, in Ferguson, Eric Gardner, is that my name is Justice, and growing up my whole life, I was raised to see things in like an equal type of lens to see like the good and bad on both sides of things and uh, like following my name I wanted to like see like oh what happened like for the police officer and what happened to like what like they had the evidence for like the victim like there's clearly more evidence for Eric Gardner than mm -hmm. Ferguson yeah and uh like the video and all and I thought that was like crazy how the officer didn't have any like punishment uh put upon him because there was clear evidence that he did excessive force at the chokehold, and then the other officers jumped on him. Uh, today, I did not go to the walkout. Six period, I had a certain assignment that I had to finish, and I really needed, like, like not saying grades are a challenge or anything, but, like, I really wanted to like, get that out of the way for sure before, like, I had to, uh, oh, I don't have to, like, worry about it in the future. And I do, like, I wanted to really go out to that uh, walkout. Like, I was able to see the walkout from my, like, classroom window. And what happened was the teacher eventually just said, like, since there's not that many kids in here and uh, y'all clearly have a reason to stay in this class, that we're just going to do a study hall and we just really re relax for the last period of the day. And it was it was really nice to have, but a lot of the students in that classroom, like where I was, really also wanted to go outside and like uh, have their opinion heard about what the whole situation is happening across the country. Um, can I add to what? because I wanted to speak on behalf of my students that did not want to join tonight. And I think it was really powerful to hear the reasons. I invited uh, four of my young black males to come. And all four of them said they would think about it and then said no, they didn't want to do it. And that was in separate conversation. And what was interesting to me was that uh, we had had conversations, we've been having conversations since the last week. And we, we just had a student killed, a sophomore. Um, and one of the students said was because it was all so fresh that they're getting killed by the police, they're getting killed by each other, that uh, one of the most powerful statements I heard was, you know, eventually we're not going to have black people anymore. They're going to make us go extinct. But it was mm -hmm. that. I think it's very raw for some of my youth in my classroom. And another one was just said, I don't know if I'll be able to control myself in the conversation. So, you know, I, I bring my sons on because I'm raising two young men of color right now, and, and this is a very real concern for, like, you know, for any parent, but I worry every day they go out. Like, they don't seem as worried, and I worry. Um, and then with my own students, they're more worried right now about each other killing each other, and that's very real. We had a lockdown today after school because we had a shooting again. So it was, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot going on for the kids. And um, and also for parents that are sending their kids out to that to you know those kind of, to the streets basically. Yeah. So jump in, folks. Where, yeah. Where? I, I wanted to ask a question um, in terms of like how did you guys actually organize the walkout? I'm real curious about that because I, I mentioned earlier in the pre um in the in our pre talk that uh, my students were were um, tried to go 45 minutes late to an organized um, event on Temple's campus, but because it was 45 minutes late, when we asked them where were they going, they were kind of just trying to use an excuse really just to leave school, and then they ended up turning around. But part, part of my message to them, like, if you guys get organized, like, you would have been able to actually do it, and you, with a sincere reason, nobody's going to stand in your way. So I'm curious, like, how did you guys organize around, um, you know, the walkout? That was 
you were the one that went to it. Yeah. Okay, um, so basically uh, a lot of it was spread through uh, social media, and um, a lot of people were posting about it on like Instagram and how we have our own uh, Berkeley High Instagram, and there are a lot of and everybody is interconnected with at least somebody of a different kind of group of people at the school. Um, a lot of posters were also put up around the school, and um, basically the entire word just got around really, really fast, and we kind of had planned about it for about a week or two, and um, it was organized actually by our student government, and um, it was like a, the, the administration couldn't really deny us because it is our right to be able to assemble and protest, mm -hmm. but... Basically, they were like saying, "Don't do it," but they were shaking their heads as to do it. As um, my vice principal also was doing the same thing. She really wanted us to. However, she couldn't uh, actually uh, allow, like, say, do it, organize it at all because uh, it is against the rules for um, faculty to uh, allow the kids off camp uh, to have the kids assemble during class off campus, such a, for that such a type of thing. So I'm losing my voice. Yeah, and this comes in the wake of Berkeley having, this was the fourth night of protests. We've yeah. had protests every single night um, and, and shutting down of streets and helicopters every single night oh, for since Saturday night. And, you know, the, the, I mean, I have heard some wondering about what's going on there. Like there is um, the attacking banks, for example, on Saturday, and um, so has the movement in Berkeley kind of expanded beyond the race issues, and or is it sort of getting at what the students were saying earlier, that this is a human rights issue, or how, how do we tease out that question? Like, it is race, but it's not just race. Um, uh, we're kind of losing you on sound, Paul. We, oh. I, th I think we heard, is it would be teasing it out as a race issue or? Yeah. Sorry. I'll lean in a little bit. Did that make any difference? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so somebody else pick it up then. <laughs> um, I strongly believe that this is um, a human rights issue because um, following the news, uh, there's been more than lots of shootings from police. Um, and not only that, apparently there was this case during August, I don't know, I don't remember. But a white cop shot a white man. No, wait, I take that back. He killed a white man. And I actually recently heard this last week from um, listening to a discussion. And it was that just changed my thoughts because at first I thought it was a racial issue as well because there was a lot of shootings with black people and versus the white police until I find out, oh wait, what? There was this white cop shooting or killing a white man? Okay, I take that back. And I truly believe that this is, um, it doesn't have to do with race, it just has to do with how a how like a policeman would come and in I don't know like um how a policeman will sometimes act rationally. It truly, truly, truly is something that like needs to be enforced that policemen should like know what they're doing. They shouldn't be really um going all of a sudden attacking a person. I mean I understand the pro I think, and like it was all in self-defense, but it's still really, really harsh for someone to just do that. Mm -hmm. Kristen, um, and and can, can we do a mic check? Can can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. You can, and I think we're okay. So, uh, one one of the statistics uh, that came out of a, a study that was released, I think, last week or recently, indicated that um, it was, you know. If you if you look at the proportions of white people and African American uh, people, it, it's 21 times more likely that you'll that um, if you're if you're black you'll you'll get um, you'll be, get shot by a cop, right? So and and killed. So you know people are using that statistic and 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 just lots and lots of stories and experiences. 
to to kind of say that this is a race issue, that it goes beyond just police brutality. And I was just wondering if what other people think about that. I mean, well, I'll just kind of jump in uh, yeah. on on the whole <clears throat> on the race issue. I mean, really, I, I I just think it's more of a if you have a historical perspective of actually what's going on um, in in the history of the United States, like ever since. First of all, people of color have never been citizens of the United States. I'm specifically talking about descendants of Africans, right? So even if you go back to the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, that just ended slavery. It didn't necessarily make African Americans sovereign citizens, right? And and to me, citizens don't have to fight for rights. So the fact that an entire swath of the population was fighting for rights in the country that they were supposed to be sovereign citizens to speaks to the issue of they were never necessarily sovereign citizens. Okay, And then if you think back to the beginning of why police departments were started in this country, it was to protect property. And originally in this country, the only people that could be property owners were white men. So if you look at it at a historical perspective, there has never been a period of time where the police was not used to brutalize, contain, protect white man's property, and nothing much else. So to try to transition these organizations that are only, you know, 150, 200 years old, like it's, it's not like there's ever been a time of peace. So I think the, one of the most important things is to know that this isn't a new phenomenon, right? Like this isn't like we got cops going bad, <laughs> right? Like we, and, and then the other thing is, okay, let's look at Ferguson, or, or, or let's, let's look at what happened in New York. There is a group of people that sat together in a room, watched the police officer choke a man on video, right, and said, hey, you know, nothing criminal happened, as far as we could tell. Like, this is the issue, and this has always kind of been the issue uh, I, I just recently watched a documentary, uh, Tim Wise, uh, it's called White Like Me, uh, and, and it just speaks more specifically to the whole concept of white privilege. And it's not necessarily racism, but 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 being able to, like, and, and one of the most powerful questions that he asked in the documentary, he asked white, young white people, what does it mean to be white? And they literally were confused about that answer, because being part of the dominant culture means you never have to think about it. Like, it's just, it just normal. It's just, you know, like, I have to think about what it means to be black, what it means to put a hood on your head, what it means to walk in the store at a certain time. I have to think about what it means to, you know, pull over or show my hands when the police pulls me over. I've got to think about that, right? But to not have to think about that is a certain type of privilege that was baked into the foundation of this country. And if you just really think about how long it takes for something to change, we're not that far removed from when it was, you know, blatant racism and the people that set up the institution at the time were baking those institutionalized processes in to make sure that there was a second class citizen regardless of who were, was like executing the laws or running the laws they always had these pockets of people to control it so I think if you just look at it historically this isn't a new phenomenon right and this is just like now we can we can kind of see it you know in our faces more because of YouTube and CNN or, or what have you but if, if, if there are people that's talking about it might not be a race issue, I don't think they're looking at the historical piece of it. I think they're saying, well, it's wrong to shoot anybody that doesn't do anything. Yeah, it, 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 it is. I, I, I would agree with that. But I, I, I just think that it's, it's dangerous to, to continue to ignore the race factors that are obviously, you know, spearing their ugly little heads. Yeah, and Al, to add to that, um, one of my classes is reading Dead Man Walking. And she's, uh, you know, she's volunteering, or she lives in uh, New Orleans, you know, in the, in the projects in New Orleans. And so we read some of the opening passages from that book today, and this is in the 80s. And as I was reading it, the kids were like, this sounds like just the same news report I heard last night. You know, especially the part about, uh, and this is a, a white woman narrating this story, um, how um, she noticed that the newspapers take notice, you know, when white people are killed, but people were killed in these projects. Black people were killed in the projects a lot, but, um, you know, she seems to be a pretty objective narrator, and she says, yeah, it just, it, nobody takes notice. And, and I was struck by the fact that the kids, like, 
a bunch of them just put their books down and said, like, this sounds really familiar to us. This is the same narrative. Uh, just to chime in here on a, one other uh, problem of the, a lot of the here in uh, Berkeley um, for a lot of the protests uh, have been kind of shoved. Uh, I actually uh, witnessed this um, for one of the news reporters and uh, cameraman. Uh, they were kind of staying away from the protests. And I went up to them and I actually asked them why. And they said it was because they were scared. And it's because of the past time. For uh, the other protests, there have been violence, but this one was completely nonviolent. Nothing actually happened um, to El Sadin. Uh, every single protest other than this, there has been violence. And the news reporters have only focused on that and that alone. They haven't talked about, oh, how like thousands of people have gathered and shut down a freeway. They only focused on how, oh, a Walgreens was broken into and the ATMs were smashed. And they only tend to focus on the negative parts of things because they don't want us to, uh, I don't think they actually want to understand the true concept of what uh, we are actually trying to raise awareness for. And that part, part of that is is uh, just a few stupid people actually doing stupid acts, but they don't focus on the thousands of other people who are actually getting their voices, trying to get their voices heard. But when nothing happens in that big of a media, it's also a huge problem because they uh, influence thousands of people who actually watch the news. And it just kind of sucks to know that these people aren't actually looking out for us. Hey, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, if I could I'm, chime in on that, I no, heard no, no, a story... No, no, no on NPR where they were saying story if it's non-violent those stories don't sell and so that's why they're not on the news because there was um, a website that tried to stop put, putting negative stories on their thing on their website and they had like a dramatic loss of views and so they had to put only like stuff where things are happening because that's what people want to see and how, yeah. do you feel, how do you feel about that? What do you think? I, I don't think that's a good thing, but at the same time, I will click on a video or like a, um, a link that has like something going on rather than reading a peaceful, like about a peaceful march. So, I mean. Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, I was going to say, Sam. Yeah. Um, um, uh, our folks, uh, particularly in Berkeley, uh, did you guys connect with um, like the Berkeley students at uh, the university, and like what's the connection there? Because interestingly, here in Philly, right, there was uh, the students at the University of Pennsylvania. They uh, they crashed the party of the president of the University of Penn Pennsylvania and, and Gutman, and they crashed. They did a they did a die in at her at her um, at a shindig. Was real fancy fancy. And then they were pushing her, though, not just to do the die-in, they were pushing about the university's policy itself and that the university is a big income generator and they basically don't pay any taxes. And so there's been a push to um, do a program called Payment in Lieu of Taxes because they receive so many benefits in the city, yet they're not paying like taxes. And, and we're like... And, but yeah, we have schools that are suffering that are dire need of resources. So I'm wondering, like, were were there any col collaborations with uh, local universities with protests around um, any other parts of the country? Um, uh, well, actually, uh, while we were protesting, uh, we did go all the way to Berkeley. When we went to Berkeley campus, um, we did shout, uh, um, "UC Berkeley, like, showed us this way. Join us now," kind of thing. We, it was some kind of a slogan that we were saying. And then um, we thought about, and I was actually thinking a lot about this, and how Berkeley was one of the first, UC Berkeley and Berkeley in general, was one of the first to um, raise awareness about apartheid in Africa. Mm -hmm. And the other part, the, a, a, lot of, a lot of problems have been, uh, folk, uh, have been raised awareness by in Berkeley. But um, I just, like, it's kind of, like, we did, we were shouting, and a lot of students actually did join us. And while we were even, we weren't even at Berkeley at one point, we were still in front of city, uh, in front of city hall in Berkeley, and um, we we, uh, we shouted, "Who's Berkeley High here?" And then we shouted, "Who's Ber Who's Berkeley University?" And there was a huge number of people who actually, I think it was maybe like a good, I mean, at that time there were only maybe 500 kids, but about 60 of them were from UC Berkeley, and I just like the fact that Berkeley, uh, the University of Berkeley, is actually 
also trying to raise awareness, and they're huge. They were actually a huge, a huger part of it because the fact that they joined up and they're also very nonviolent. And they also, when we went to Camp Anili, we did lie down, and they lied down with us uh, for some moments of for four minutes for moments of silence. And then they also, um, they also kind of gave good speeches about it, and they had their megaphones. And they really assembled very fast, and I, they were informed of it. But the fact that they joined us when it was our organization, but really uplifted my spirits personally. Cool. I wanted to. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Okay, great. I wanted to add into the conversation. I know one of the things that's been um, coming up at our school is um, so one of our, our social studies teacher is going into a American Revolutionary War uh, unit, and this conversation of violent versus nonviolent protest. I think it's a very interesting conversation that I. I would love to uh, hear from the youth about about this focus on nonviolence, uh, especially around these issues. When you think of the historical implications of when um, we have such an esteem for um, that time in America when people took up arms and fought for what they thought was right, and how that sort of like, which is not so far in the past, but how that affects when we talk about revolution and we talk about uh, fighting for our dignity, and I think that fight was around like no taxation without representation. Um, this is, you know, people are dying. Um, so we think about like violence and nonviolent protests. Has that come up in your youthful, um, in your youth-driven conversations around protest, and how do you feel about people who are doing violent acts or are um, burning cars on fire or setting cars on fire, and how do you reconcile that within the conversation? Um, I feel like those people who are like actually causing violence and like protest, they're just really like, it's a really sad issue. And yes, people can be upset about it, but I think those people are like really taken to heart about the fact that like these are people of like my like people of my skin color that are just dying because of police brutality. And I feel like a lot of them think that like, oh, this like this can ha this is probably going to happen here, so they're just acting out against it. Probably maybe fear because. Um, in eighth grade, my teacher, she uh, she's an active protester. She made an uh, organization called Cop Watch, where they video record cops in action, like apprehending people. And like they, uh, what she's what Cop Watch really does is it makes sure that cops follow like the procedure that they were like trained for, to like read out the Miranda rights and uh, not really like mistreat the people that they're apprehending. And what she also taught uh, my eighth grade class is that. Uh, how to act around police and how, like, you always go, like, the first thing you ask the police officer is, officer, am I being detained? And if he says, no, you're not being detained, then the best thing to do is just say, uh, I, have, I have the right to not speak to you and, I, and I'm going to use it and just walk away from him. And what also, like, is sad to see is that, like, most, the majority of my friends are people of color and most of them live around me, so we walk home sometimes. And there's, we live on one of, like, the more busier streets of uh, Berkeley, and what we notice that like more officers are like driving up and down it, and when we walk, uh, like every time they see a police officer, they they'll take their hands out their pocket, take off their hood, uh, walk a little bit slower, and just just make sure not to like they don't stare at the like, officer dead in his eye, but they'll like acknowledge him. And uh, if a cop is like walking or walking right by him, we just uh, just like don't even think about it. But they, I I don't personally I don't really think about it. I just think like, oh, he's here to protect the peace and all, and just make sure nothing like really seriously like, bad happens. But what my friends see is as like, oh, this guy has a gun. He's uh, he, a threat to my life. Even sometimes, like if it gets to that point of like of conversation between us and the officer, so what they do is they just make sure that they're careful about being around an officer. They, uh, like I said, take their hands out their pocket, take off their hood, acknowledge the officer, maybe even say hi, and just keep walking and go about their business. Christopher, can I, I mean, because I, I think that's an interesting question that you pose about the violence and looking at it, and, and I'm curious to know, and from the youth, but you specifically, since you kind of posed the question, like, do you see a relationship with the response to, let's say, a United States violence that, that ISIS has demonstrated against sovereign citizens of America and, and the response to that and what's going on? with, you know, obvious injustices to the people of color in this country. Like, um, do, do you see a correlation with those things, or are those just two separate things? Oh, I'm asking oh. Christopher, and I'm asking, like, the youth. 
Yeah, yeah. I think. Um, sorry, to, uh, you just sort of like jumping in, but the I saw a great cartoon earlier today because um, you know the CIA torture report was released, and Dick Cheney's on the cover, and uh, it's a cartoon, and Dick Cheney says, uh, "We have to do what we have to do to protect the interests of this country," and then directly next to it is the ISIL uh, sort of um, who we paint to be a terrorist who's saying we, we have to do what we have to do to protect the interests of this country. And it's like the same exact saying and underneath the same role. So when I when I think about how um, when I think about the justifications, the justifications of violence, I see that um, a lot of contradictions. Um, I think uh, well, Malcolm X, right, who says um, if it's okay for the state to be violent, then it's okay for us to uh, engage in violence against, you know, um, I know I'm messing up that quote. I got to pull up some high. But, the point's uh, clear, yeah. Yeah, but just that ballot or bullet uh, speech. Um, so, yeah, I definitely see a lot of contradictions in that. And I think that, uh, especially with um, our conversation in the classroom, and we talk about, um, like, violence and nonviolence, um, we have to honor that. There were times in this country, in our history, not even in this country, but in this world, where people took violent approaches, and that was honored as a, as a justifiable thing. And we have to think about the implications of why it was justifiable. So, I, And, and I, I want to complicate it to say that, you know, as this weekend I was working with a ninth grader, and when, when we asked him a similar question that I asked at the beginning, like, what, what are the issues... Um, for you right now around all this, he talked about bullying, right? And um, and that that's that, those are some of the issues that he's facing in his his school experience. Um, and and then w when he looked at the stories um, that we have up on youthvoices.net slash Black Lives Matter, um, the, the, in his mind. Those were were like extensions. Those cops were being bullies, right? <laughs> so so it's the framework. And 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 if I can add in Joe's uh, comments earlier about what's what's immediately in front of the young people in Oakland in her school is are these shootings that have happened, not the police shootings necessarily. So I'm just wondering how we can honor young people's experience. Um, and connect with with what's going on too, in some way. I, I <laughs> that wasn't really a question. I just wanted to put out there. There's this, and and then and then the torture stuff, as you just brought up. So there's this there's this soup of violence out there, right? <laughs> that um, that this is coming out of, and and I think that's important to recognize somehow. Well, yeah, and I think um, the soup of violence is an interesting image because. You know, I have another, a couple other groups. Uh, one's looking at, um, you know, school violence and the role that mental health has, um, and you know, like not treating teens' mental health issues sometimes, you know, leads to um, some of these violent shootings, school shootings, um, and and we're starting to like some of the research is overlapping, you know, like. Uh, Gun violence, well, you know, like we're a heavily armed people, and so you have police who are afraid that, you know, everybody there, or a lot of people that they're going to apprehend have their hands in their pockets and there's a weapon in there. And so, you know, that's kind of mixed up in class. You know, so like we're finding that a lot of the stories, I, I'm seeing that there's a lot of overlap in the stories. But I think in, in, in stating that, right, like, Let's let's use a broad brush, okay? Let's say that anybody that acts uncharacteristically violent is suffering from mental health issues. So that means that we have police officers that are suffering from mental health issues. That means that we have grand juries that are suffering from mental health issues. And let's, if, even if we use that broad brush, right, it, it still kind of gets to the larger problem mm -hmm. of something's the matter with a lot of people's thought processes, right, where, where you can get a group of people in a room, watch a video of a man being choked to death, and they're being able to be convinced, right, that because an officer says, I didn't use a chokehold, 
even though the coroner says this guy was murdered because of a chokehold, that they can be convinced. Like, okay, let's let's call it mental health, or or let's call it bullying. Let's call it whatever it is. But to to pretend like these these are just kind of isolated. Uh, well, that's one bad cop. No, there's a pattern of systemic injustice. Like, okay, I believe in something called an epigenetic effect, right? Well, basically, your environment can actually change your genes. And as a person of color, I realize that I am a descendant of the survivors of the slave trade, right? Well, one of the things that's, you know, advantageous for people of color is to have a high tolerance of injustice, right? Like if it was 1850 and I want to say, hey, I need some rights and this is wrong, I'm probably not going to live to procreate. So we are descendants from the survivors. I'm a 42-year-old male, and my response to all of this wildness going on is to do a video chat with people around the country. Like that's a very docile response. If, if, if you really just put it into context, but I think that as people of color, we've been engineered to to beg the oppressor to stop. It's kind of like, okay, listen, this is what? wrong. Like, can't you see that it's not right and black lives matter? It's like, no, at, 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 at some point, right, and, and I don't know when it is, and I'm not promoting violence or anything, but at some point, right, the only thing that, that certain entities understand is the language in which they speak, right? And this country was founded with the language of violence, ask the Native Americans, right? Like, th there is not an, a historical period of time in this country where violence didn't advance civilization in some way, fashion, or form, you know? So, and I, I don't know, I, I think you can paint it all with, with a broad brush if you want to use bullying, mental health, whatever it is, there's a huge mm -hmm. problem larger than just a couple of bad cops, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, actually, not all cops are bad. We only hear about the bad cops. Like, many of them do try to, like, I don't know, like, do good things, but, like, they're they're not all bad. It's I still think it's a corrupt, like, system, but it's, they're not all bad. Okay, and, I'm, I'm, and then I'm going to stop because I know I'm hogging the whole thing. But Darren Wilson was trained to be a police officer at a previous police department that was shut down because the whole entire police department was determined to have been like racist. And then he becomes a cop in a different police department and he shoots an unarmed black and he gets off for doing it because of some things that he says happen. And then there isn't a, a, enough evidence to even let that go to trial. To me that speaks to uh, how the society or the culture that exists in Ferguson treats the life of a white person, or white a person, not white people in general, but let's say a white man and a black man, okay? And and we can say that the, the black man had a checkered pass, and we saw him earlier that day stealing cigarillos, but he was a police officer that was trained by a, you know, a police department that is racist and disbanded. And that's never even talked about in the, in the media when they start even talking about the whole Ferguson situation. So, you know, I do... Some of my best friends are cops, right? Like, I, I know the chief of police of Bessemer. I'm from Bessemer and, and all of that. So I'm, I'm not, you know, saying all cops are bad or anything. But I, I do think that there are a, a lot of traditions that started a, a long time ago that are still being, you know, upheld by the institutions themselves and not necessarily as much by all of the individuals that participate in an institution. Al, did you just say some of my best friends are cops? I just oh, wanted to yeah. check you on that. Some of my best friends are cops. <laughs> okay. I'm glad you caught that, Paul. That was, that was on purpose. Right. If I could, uh, just to, uh, get in for a second. I do hear you, Ariana, about, um, and I think that's one of the conversations that um, we don't really have about um, sort of like racism or any of the isms when we talk about oppression, is there's a difference with, there's this, um, differences between the individual people, like, I, we're teachers, me, Al, Paul, we're all, but we still, and while we are working to, you know, step away from our our racism, we still work in a, a system, educational system, that proves to be sort of racist against um, a, a, a set specific uh, people, 
And um, so it's like we all always are battling with yeah how we are individually, but then how how the system and how the system is structured. So I think you are you are right that not all cops are are bad, but when we when we think about how the system of policing is designed in America, we do have to consider that it does cause an impact upon a group of people, a disparate impact. So I just want to honor that that you are you do have something there when you say not all cops are bad. Um, and when we talk about like the differences between individuals and systems, I think I'll try to post some stuff into the chat about it. I'm not so, saying it's like it's not a corrupt business. Like I, I mm -hmm. totally think it is because I know that many, many minorities like are not treated right. Like it's not only black people that are being shot, it's like Mexicans, like it's oh, yeah. it's all minorities. Sure. Like Latinos are being shot too. It's all people who are brown. It's not just black well, people. So I know it's corrupt, but like I don't know. And Ariana, I I, I want to rush in and and add into you know the the kids who are coming who were coming across the border, um, are are escaping violence too, right? So the the the, immig the immigration push is is about violence in a way too. Um, it's worth worth remembering, I think, often. But I, so so I. I I, I mentioned the soup of violence and and the bullying and and the the bigger picture or not the bigger picture necessarily but the honoring what our students are thinking to, to ask the question how do we move from that to helping them see the more systemic things that you guys are talking about but I'm wondering if um, but we're running out of time and I want to give students a chance to kind of ask their questions like. I mean, I think this has been a pretty good dialogue between young people and older people, but what are your questions? Somebody early on said, I wanted to find out what adults were thinking. Um, <laughs> but so what are your questions? What are your thoughts about what's going on um, at this point? Um, actually, I have a question. I just wanted to ask, like, since we uh, we said it was uh, a lot of the problems was rooted in something that's been going on for many, many years, I just wanted to want to understand like who's fault. You can, is there somebody that we can actually pin this on? Like we can actually blame for corrupting the systems? Like is it our elderly who hold on to their old ways, or the people who are trying to like the one percent who are trying to influence a certain kind of generation into thinking that trying to influence our youth into something different that they're not, or like just our teachers in general who. We don't necessarily see every day, but are actually trying to influence the children that they teach. Like, is there any one person we can pin it on, or is it just the fact that we're America and we're different? Um, well, can, I, I, can I try to answer that? I don't yeah. think that there is one person to blame. I think that there, it's just that's how the business started. That's how like the um, Europeans came to the new country and they tried to change like the Native Americans' ways because they thought their way was better. So it's not really one certain person, it's just the way that the, they were like, the mindset that the people who, who came here had. So their mindset got spread to everyone else. It's not really one certain person though. Yeah, I agree with Ariana. You, there's so many factors to like each incident that you can't pin like one person just for doing it. Um, like. Many people will try finding the person who did the action, but like it all depends on how it was created, why it was created. You know, you're six, like you're five, you've been since one age. It there's so many factors to each incident that you can't say, oh, because this guy picked a fight with them, that's his fault, or he shot him, he caused the incident. You can't really say that there's so many factors to it that you cannot like like so you cannot say is that you cannot like pin it all on one person because like it's a domino effect. It's had so many factors like even the environment and what situation it was, how a person would think common sense is. Mm -hmm. Um, I if I would step in, I think um, I think that's a great question, and for me, how I I think that answer 
is something that we're not all sure on. But I, for me, how I define it is the is white supremacy. And um, while we think of white supremacy and is is mostly connected with the white people, um, it does take two. It does uh, it it does it is a system that can be also perpetuated by people of color. Um, and as like as Ariana was talking about, not just black, but just all forms of minorities, all forms that we're we're in this system of white supremacy, and it causes these type of things to happen. And um, kind of what Al was speaking to earlier too about of just like this system that we're in. There are some actions that we need to take all as individuals. Um, Tim Wise, who J Al talked about as well, talks about it as the dirty dishes. There's dirty dishes in a sink, and Somebody has to wash them. So it's really going to take all of us working together and holding each other accountable, us being white people as well, us people of color, working together to be able to move us past this system that we're in. Mm -hmm. so, I, go ahead. I want to invite Carlos back here in a second, but go ahead. What happened? Carlos, I'm sorry. Are we still? Yeah, we're still. I, th I thought we froze or something. Carlos, yeah. what what have you been thinking? And and I, um, I, I wanted to, I wanted to ask. Um, I mean, do you live in West Valley? Uh, I do Valley? not, but I do live in an area which is uh, predominantly uh, of minorities mm -hmm. and in particular Latinos, which is what where I live. Can, can you talk at all about your personal experience? Is it is that impacted at all? In your uh, understanding of the situation, or well, not too much for me in particular. But I have had, uh, I've seen, I've heard, read about it a lot, and it just kind of, a, you know, there's, I have family that does live in West Valley, and it's just really interesting, you know, the idea that people see it as, uh, like the minorities being targeted by the officers in West Valley. But I just, wa I, I want to get to talk to someone like that, an officer of West Valley, to see what they, what they think about it. And like if they think that their system is corrupt and everything, but just like how Christopher is saying, that a lot of the systems are, and I believe that that one is one, and that maybe. So you suspect it is, yeah. Hmm. Yes, I do. So, and, and I was wondering, uh, the, the, the young people from um, Berkeley, but also from Michigan, um, Okemos? Okemos, you told me okay. at the beginning. Yeah, okay. Um, what, whether, have you thought about the. The um, you know the police forces and the judicial systems in your communities at all, sort of the way that Carlos has has done, done that. Well, I don't know if it's the same for Kristen, but I don't think we really have as much of a problem with it here, or maybe like not in our city, but like maybe the next city over we do. But I haven't really heard anything like mm -hmm. too much. I don't know. It's. I mean, all cops like are kind of corrupt, but I haven't heard anything too bad over mm -hmm. on our side. Yeah, not as I bad as where there's more like minorities. Mm -hmm. um, well, so, so say that again. So, so in your community, it's not as bad because there aren't minorities. Well, in our city, there's it's mostly white people, so it's like it's people of privilege, and so it, it, we don't really have as much of a problem. But in the neighboring city, I, it might be more of a problem, but we don't really hear about it as much. Well, like over here in Berkeley, like what like my eighth grade teacher showed us, through, like showed me through cop watches that they don't really target minorities. You see a lot of the cops are actually targeting like homeless people and seeing people that are like, down on their luck and that are not as like not as blessed as some people are, like, they will, like, on Telegraph, like, one of the most, like, like the street of Berkeley is Telegraph, really. Like, you'll see cops just walk up to homeless people and tell them, like, oh, you guys got to get up and leave. You're, like, polluting the public. And it's, like, sad to see that because it's, like, where are they going to go? Like, the, all the parks, like, really, like, the public ones, they're all already, like, packed with uh, uh, homeless people. And then, like, you go to, like, Oakland and you see the same thing. Like, there's just so much homeless people around. And, like, uh... Of course, like like OPD, like in Oakland, like they, yeah, like yeah, I've seen like they've also like targeted minorities, like mostly, but in Berkeley, it's like a kind of a different story, really. It's like yes, they target a certain group of people, but they target like not one person of a certain race. They target people 
for uh, like a different class also so kind of and it's like also like around the Bay Area because like you also you could also go to San Francisco and see the same thing. There's like homeless people all around the street just like trying to like survive like with what they have and offer telling like oh you got to move you guys got to get out of here because they are just in people's ways but like they are kind of working that way. Like, they never had an opportunity for really like, like succeeding life. Like, that is that because like cops just want them like, out of their like ways and it's like yeah. yeah. Just justice, right? Um, what are, what are your questions as we close off here tonight? Um, so like we right now like me personally like, we're being raised to like how to act around police. Like we're raised to like they're they're peacekeepers, but they're also like we, there's also evidence that they have been uh, very brutal to the public. Uh, when growing up for you, like the older, like the older people here, uh, what did your parents teach you how to act around him, or, or like did they even teach you anything about like how to act around cops, and did they have a different perspective of cops at like when raising you than they do like parents now? Okay, uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna jump in because I grew up learning to drive in the city where they was locking Martin Luther King up in Birmingham. So yeah, we had a lot, lot of lessons. Uh, Avoid them, <laughs> like just you know, try not to be stopped. Um, you know, and, and that's kind of like trying not to be black because I mean, literally, I live in a state where let's say 20% of the entire state population is black, and maybe 80 to 85% of the moving violations are people of color. So either black people are terrible drivers, or there is this phenomenon of you know. The, police just seeking us out. Now, the elephant in the room is there are a lot of black criminals. They exist. They're real. They're out there. Okay, <laughs> Everybody in prison ain't innocent. However, if you actually look at the crime they're involved in, most of them are associated with trying to survive within like selling drugs. That's a real way to make money. Right? There are no poppy fields in the hood though. Right? Like I couldn't take a two liter soda from Birmingham to Chicago on the plane. But it's pounds and pounds of certain drugs. So just growing up, my, my parent, my, my, my mother, um, just kind of instilled in me that, listen, don't give them a reason. You know, they, 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 you know you, my mother used to always tell me this, and I, I, I sum it up. She said, you could be right, but you also could be dead right. So don't come telling me what's right, right? Like, your goal is to live another day. So, yeah, we, you know, drive slow. Yeah, I, um, you know, it's it's become pretty common now for our understanding of, um, because of this, what's been going on, um, what you just said, that 80% of the citations are for African American people and it's only 20%, that kind of thing. And then putting that together with Ariana's um, comment that, like, we live in segregated cities still, right, and communities, and we don't necessarily know what's going on in, in each other's lives. So I, I think, for me, that's what this is all about. This is all about, you know, waking up to to some of the issues that, uh, you know, African-American friends um, are, are more familiar with, unfortunately. Um, other, but we're way over time here. Um, we should kind of respect each other's time. Um, Don, sorry, you weren't there right at the beginning. Do you have any kind of final thoughts here? As yeah, that's okay. I, I was glad yeah. to defer to listening to my students because yeah. the the conversations for us, as they echoed, have been very different because of our location. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the interest challenge uh, for us is how how do we make sure that we're making sense of what's going on and, and recognizing things in within our community or neighboring communities and in the world and so how, how do we make sense of it all we've had the media conversations and, and some of the, the different conversations but this conversation tonight makes it I think much more real for for them to hear what other people are saying as well. So thank you for that. Yeah. So, 
just to say, I mean, many of us here are um, either on Youth Voices already or wanting to get there. Um, I, I added a tiny little feature on the front page of Youth Voices, and it's called Featured Missions. And one of the featured missions is Black Lives Matter. Um, and, and it's a whole, uh, I think, a pretty quick unit, um, a pretty quick little project where um, there are 25 uh, Wikipedia articles about uh, um, African American men and women who have been um, killed, um, and and so and then the, the goal is to then have to write some poetry about m memorializing those lives. But the point of that really is to have a place for us to have conversation. And so I want to kind of recommend that as one one place where we can continue to have some conversation around some poetry and uh, around these issues. Um, so. And there are plenty of other places as well, as we know, but I wanted to point to yeah. one possibility here. Anyone who want to jump yeah, in with to, last thoughts? Please, Chris, yes. I was hoping, Carlos, I hope you could connect with uh, Joe's sons, um, because I think uh, one of the things we'll talk about tomorrow, I think, is how this conversation is influencing the story that Carlos is telling. And um, so I hope you guys are open to it, because I think uh, you both have some uh, things you could learn from each other, speaking of connections. Yeah. Carlos. So thank you all. Um, uh, we will, I, if you guys don't mind, we're going to continue this next week um, in some way, and we'll just keep inviting people. And, and so um, thank you all. Uh, uh, we'll be here um, next Wednesday again. Uh, this is Teacher Seeking Teachers. The, um, it is a channel of the World Bridges Network um, at edtechtalk.com slash TTT um, that Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier started up um, s several years ago. Thank you all, and um, let's keep talking. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.